as system grow and age, they start to be very hard to maintain. Some systems can be very bulky. We had a lot of headcount, a lot of people on board. So we have a lot of code. Often we even have, you know, a lot of business features, a lot of things implemented, and it can start becoming very hard to handle. This means that those systems lack flexibility and scalability that maybe they had before. At the end, this may hinder our ability to drive forward with change and help our business remain competitive in a market that is ever changing and ever growing. And we still keep to maintain a lot of code that was written before even our time at the organization. Moreover, often there's even a lot of tools and frameworks we want to utilize to empower ourselves and our product teams to build even better features and build amazing things as we saw our peers in other organizations. And we, we know we see all of these cool, great open source tools and we want to utilize them. This means that... You know, modernization efforts far more than just refreshing for our stack or our technology. The main value of this is actually be able to revisit past decisions that we have made, whether those are technology decisions or business decisions to our organization structure, to our user needs. And with these more broader factors, the modernization efforts are here to help us rethink and re-engage with our internal pain points to be able to move forward faster and far more efficiently. Trying to look into a large application, trying to figure out how can we even look into it and start breaking it down or starting to modernize it. We always hit with this question about how much does it take? How much effort does it take to modernize this or even a piece of this application? We don't always know everything about each system, right? It, those are very vast. Sometimes we need several architects to even join together to better understand. Systems tend to be not well documented, especially things that happened in the past and haven't been updated. Sometimes you even have a vast array of hidden dependencies that you are not aware. And more importantly, the effort to modernize a single application also competes with the same amount of development resources, the time actually it takes to build new features. And then there's also the case about what do we prioritize? Are we building a new thing or are we spending more time on refactoring? And priorities can also shift midway. And even during this migration process, we even learn more about our problems, our topic, our decisions. And this can potentially even cause us to revisit some of the things that we've just improved a few months back. As I'm sure that a lot of you encountered in the past, this also make it very hard to get buy-in from other stakeholders, other architects, other team leaders, other business stakeholders to buy into the idea of, hey, let's modernize this because we're going to get out of those benefits, right? We'll be able to ship faster if we spend a couple of weeks fixing something or a couple of months moving from one technology to another or doing refactor in specific areas of the code. In the two demos that we're going to show here, I want to try and talk about something of a different nature almost like having a evergreen modernization effort. So regardless of how you're managing migration processes of technology migration process today, we are always working in these muddy fields. These muddy fields get muddy even from our decisions that we just made past week or two weeks. Every decision we made impacts future decisions. And what does it mean to turn even our processes to be evergreen? Right? Because in an ideal world, we would like to have every decision we made in our technology, in our product to be on its own green field. And in our case, what we have found is that component-driven development allows us to do so. It provides us with greater flexibility and ease of maintenance for components as we can take different features or different decisions, build them in independent, isolated components and deploy them more efficiently into our application. So with that in mind, I'd like to quickly jump to a small demo. In this demo, I have a, an actually an Ember application. I'm not sure how much time all of you spent in building web applications, but way back when, before React, before Angular, a lot of people use Ember and there is still a lot of Ember code out there. Often, you know, we want to move from been building with this technology to building with a far more updated one. In this case, maybe React. So what we can do or what Beat enables us to do using component development is 
um, alongside the same repository that we maintain our Ender code base here, you know, our application, our configs, our tests, and others, I've created a small bit workspace in this development directory. In here, I've created three components. Each of these components is completely independent, completely isolated, and also have its own dev server to build that. And the only thing I thought about coming into this very specific technology migration is what is the best way to integrate between React and Ember, and then figuring out a way to build essentially independent React components. And a React component can be as small as a button or as big as a feature or a page. Essentially take those components that I build in complete isolation and embed them back into my Ember code base. So in this case, you can see I have two main components. In this application, one of my goals is also to integrate Tailwind into Ember. So in order to integrate or use the same Tailwind configuration, the same Tailwind theme between both, I've created a single component that contains my Tailwind configuration, as you can see here, and another component that is just a basic Hello World component. As you see, each of these components, they don't have any configuration files that don't have any effect on the workspace itself. I still keep the same existing definitions for how I build, for how I deploy, for how I do everything for my Ember code. I just happen to have a small set of more modern pieces of code. In these components, I can decide whether I want to build new functionalities or whether I want to refactor all the functionality into more modern code and embed that back in. And in this particular case, porting those things back in to Ember because the component is available here for me to use, I can just import that component locally. In this case, we had to dig into Ember and figure and learn that Ember requires a UMD model and a few other requirements in order to integrate a React component back into it. But at the end of the day, once it helped us to build this component in complete isolation and integrate that into our project, then we can quickly and rapidly create more and more and more of these independent, isolated, evergreen components back into our workspace. And as an example, if it's, let me clear my terminal. I can quickly create another React component on uh, my webinar component in the same workspace, build whatever I want inside of it and integrate that back into my project. So here, for example, in my development, I have another component. Now, the interesting thing and the powerful thing about this capability is that each of these components has its own independent dev server. The build pipeline for these components are completely independent and actually run offshore from the project workspace as well. Meaning that I can make even technology decisions related to this particular component or any other component, essentially building one component as a React component, another component, maybe just vanilla JavaScript, another component just to be a node module that I need to share across and start scaling this way. Now, I know that the dev experience here may seem very familiar to monorepo structure because the bottom line of it as a developer tool, it does have some monorepo-like workloads in, especially when working locally. However, mention of components in any level of granularity with very robust namespacing systems in vast numbers across the various repositories is a unique challenge. And this is where BIT comes into play as BIT can run in a, the same repository as applications that you have in external repositories to the application, then pull those components back in or even run alongside existing applications running in monorepo repositories. So you're very flexible to embed bit whatever you need for any problem that you want. The second demo is essentially tell our own story of doing a migration, of doing a modernization of one application. Seven years ago, we didn't have bit to build bit. So we started building a large monolithic application that we call BitCLI. That application served us well for many years and still is a lot of our core functionalities are still inside of it. You can also see that in our open source Git repository. The SLC directory contains all of what we today refer to as our legacy code base, which at this point in time, we don't even touch anymore. Instead, 
what our team has decided is creating a directory called Scopes. And here we actually took something from the playbook of microservices. So we broken down our product, our technology, according to domain-driven design principles. And for each domain, we created a separate scope. And each scope contains separate components where you can think about each of these components as their own unique type of APIs. And the rule that we made for ourselves is we cannot write new capabilities inside our legacy code. Whenever we need to write a new capability, even if it's just a thin wrapper, we'll just build that thin wrapper inside the scopes directory as a bit component. For example, we have our code compare feature, right? It's completely separate from our legacy code base and this is built essentially offshore and then wraps various APIs that are inside our legacy code base. This way, what we're essentially doing is slowly chunking away from features that were implemented in legacy bit and modernizing them. So whenever we do need to touch legacy code, what we do is we just refactor it, move it to be outside and slowly while in motion, while still pushing more and more features and more capabilities into bit, we are able to actually refactor and modernize our entire code base. And the application is in motion and it essentially allows us to making evergreen decisions on each feature. We get to decide the technology, we get to decide the structure of each feature of each component and still be able to drive our technology forward, still be able to even carry our legacy with us for very complex things that at the moment we just not deem necessary to modernize. This way, with this type of strangling on our legacy code, we can slowly put to rest a code base that will serve us for a long time and modernize. It's very much similar to how you would think about, you know, having a monolithic backend application, trying to break it down to microservices, right? Let's start by being just one microservice. That one microservice get to speak with the monolith, but everything from the monolith that needs activities, only that anything can speak directly for it and so on. All of the components that are actually built in bit uh, and exported are shared for various scopes. So in other applications, in other repositories that we are building, we actually get to use all of these components as well and adapt them and get those features in other modern applications. Moreover, some of the components that are actually driving and are embedded in bit were actually built outside of the tool. So for example, we have the same design system that we use for our cloud service and built open source, which will just purposely build outside of the main bit repository and will port it in as dependencies. So essentially each of these components, right? We spoke about what is what are scopes as a domain driven thing and in, in, inside so each scope we can see all of our components available or we can read out their documentation. We can understand how to use them and we can reuse them in any other application or project we need. So we actually, by modernizing our code, by having those components run independently from the project, we even later get to iterate and improve those components from a separate flow and integrate them back to being part of a greater whole. Application modernization can be very challenging. What we see from our experience as key to success is try to reduce the inherent risk of having to modernize an application. Using component-driven approaches, using playbooks from domain-driven design and others, we can start looking at this on how we can isolate specific areas of pain or specific features that we need to improve or embed a new feature using a new technology into an existing system for a bit component. And essentially we can start a small quote unquote modernization effort without much of a buy-in, right? We can just decide that the next feature will be built inside the bit component with new technology, with new tools, with new evergreen decisions, and then integrate it back in and just improve our life as part of it. This means that we can still keep our company, our business, our team, our product flexible and able to adapt for changes during the modernization effort. It's not just about spending resources, about re-implementing existing items. It's about also structuring all your decisions 
in components, in bit components, that you can then iterate on them independently. As bit enables you to treat each individual component as a separate entity. This means that you can make informed decisions about tools, technology, and others, and even collaborate on these decisions with your peers from product design and other stakeholders. What we have found working for several years in this approach is that when we treat each component as a separate entity, we actually future proof our systems as it allows us to reconsider past decision on a per component level. Now, a component, again, it's not just a button or a page. This can be even application services and so on, which also make it that much easier to improve our system over time. If the one takeaway you can take from here is, as you modernize applications, try to build a system that allows you to keep on making those evergreen decisions without mudding your future items, requirements, features, capabilities. Because at the end of the day, we need to modernize only when we are stepping in areas that you know, spoil us and force us to make decisions that we don't necessarily want to make. And however way you can build that, this is a good way for you to drive a successful modernization effort for your stack, for your product, for your technology. And thank you very much.